We're in St. Michael's, Maryland with Pete Lesher. Pete is the curator of the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. Mm -hmm. And how long has this museum been here? It's been here since 1965 we opened our doors. It's, uh, and it's grown and grown uh, bit by bit since then. This is, a, this is a place, it grew up on an old piece of industrial property in the middle of the harbor. If you, if you roll back uh, St. Michael's 50 years or so, this would have... Well, I was here 50 years ago at St. Michael's. <laughs> and St. Michael's was a place where watermen, we call them watermen because they're not fishermen, uh, they work crabs and oysters. Right. They had their houses. There were no shops in town. There was a place where you could get your propeller fixed. There were three gasoline stations. There were three hardware stores. Mm -hmm. So this was really a waterman's village. Absolutely. Back in 1963. That's right. So then in 65, they airlift this giant lighthouse in. Well, a year or two later, yes. Okay, and it changes St. <laughs> Michael's forever. So you pick it up from there. Well, it, it, and it, the interesting thing is that, that this place, this very site, was the industrial heart of town. This is where all the seafood packing houses were. The tomato was, packing too, right? Uh, tomato packing uh, and canning, uh, but also oyster shucking over here where our boat shop now stands. And right where the lighthouse is was a, a, a house that specialized in, in crab picking. Uh, it was actually an African-American owned uh, seafood house that had been there since about 1902. And all of these businesses had a few hard years in seafood, har seafood harvesting. The oysters were down, the crabs had a few rough years, and these places started going out of business. And it was just at that moment that some very far-sighted people associated with the County Historical Society founded this Maritime Museum, saying there's a big story to be told here and we're losing this heritage. It's slipping away from us. We need something to true, grab it on it. It, really, it was disappearing. These boats were disappearing left and right. The people were the watermen were finding other, beginning to find other things to do. The, 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 that culture was visibly slipping away at that point. And so this museum was established to, uh, to, to grab a piece of that and to, to tell those stories for generations to come. Gus and Vita Van Lennep, who owned a property called Crooked Intention just outside St. Michael's, uh, got the idea of establishing a maritime museum to, to uh, uh, gather together the artifacts and, and materials and boats uh, concerning Chesapeake Bay. So uh, they, they spoke with a number of people concerning their interests, and I was one of them uh, as a local and young attorney at that time. And uh, uh, Vita was, was really the, the motivating force. She was the uh, one with the idea, she uh, developed the name Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. That was that, that came specifically from her. So plans were developed to attempt to obtain uh, the several parcels of land which made up Navy Point, and I was involved in in many of those negotiations, and we were fortunate in being able to acquire piece by piece by piece. Uh, the entire Navy Point property. I remember it was in the 60s that the Crab Club bravely put a waterfront restaurant on this industrial inner harbor, mm -hmm. and everybody thought they were crazy. <laughs> the two of them happened at just about the same time. Yes. The Crab Claw actually started out as a clam business, uh, buying clams from the watermen, actually owning some of the boats, and yes, completely transformed in, from this rather gritty business into, uh, into a seafood restaurant. Well, let's let the Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum, it's, it's a, it's a world-class maritime museum. And people who are members here can go to maritime museums across the world, right? That's right. Uh, any, any of our members at the $100 level and, ab and above are um, entitled to reciprocal admissions to uh, other members of the Council of American Maritime Museums. And as we're about to see that the investment made back in 1965 and the continued investment over the years uh, if people tried to build this today, it would cost tens of millions of dollars. Well, and if you look at the vision that the people who founded this museum had, you could never put this property together right. today if it hadn't been done back then. Well, let's let you show us around. Absolutely. So how many acres do you have here? Well, it's an 18-acre campus, 
most people wouldn't realize that uh, they think of a museum, they think of one building, and we're spread out among 10 buildings all around this, this waterfront campus. Um, exhibits outdoors, exhibits indoors, it's, there's a lot to it. it. Sure is. This is the oystering building? This is the oystering building, uh, one, of the, one of the big stories on the bay. The oystering exhibit, we tell the story of this great trade, of all this, this great fishery of, of oysters coming out of the Chesapeake Bay, around the story of this one skipjack, the E.C. Collier, and its crew back in the 1970s. Captain Jack Larimore and Turk Cannon, his jib man, Pee Wee, his cook, and all the rest of them. Uh, use, using these personal stories to tell a big story about the Chesapeake Bay. It's the sort of thing that we love to do here at the museum, to use these personal stories as examples of what the bigger picture is around the bay. One of the big stories on the bay is how we've exploited this place for its, its seafood, for its natural bounty, and particularly for oysters. Oyst more money was made on oysters on the bay over the years than anything else. And tell you part of that story, I've got an oyster tin over here. Now it's, it's a, an oyster tin from a Baltimore packer. It says Baltimore Oysters on it from J.L. McCready and son of Baltimore. But we have a letter, uh, and it's, he calls it Navy Brand. We have a letter from McCready writing to one of his customers up in Pennsylvania back in 1903 who says, I've just signed an agreement with George Calk over in St. Michael's to pack my oysters under the name of Navy brand oysters, well, or Navy Point brand. It got shortened to Navy brand, but we know where the Navy Point name came from. It's the name of this point, point of land right here in the middle of St. Michael's where George Cox Oyster House was and where the Maritime Museum is today. So, although these are Baltimore oysters, this tin could very well have been packed right here, right here in St. Michael's. And when all those oyster shells were discarded, Navy Point started out as a rather small point of land. And when the oyster packing houses wanted to, wanted to expand, they made more land by dumping all the shells, all the empty shells into the harbor and creating artificial land. And so what, much of what we know as Navy Point today is built up artificial land, built on oyster shells. Amazing, and the oyster shell is made by the oyster. Uh, it starts off as spat. That's right. And then it, it works its way up and builds up a shell. It builds up a shell. It's the shell a bivalve. Made of, made of what? In oh, it's mostly calcium. Calcium, okay. Yeah, pulls calcium out of the water column, creates this hard shell or a pair of hard shells so it can open up and filter out water and shut tight when it needs to protect itself. And all those, when the, the oyster shuckers pull the meat out, throw away the shell, right. and the shell gets used, well, maybe for road building. Right. Today we try to reserve those shells to put back in the bay because the one thing that oysters love to do, to grow on most, is other oyster shells. And that's what we're standing on right now. Essentially, that's right. This, the story in this building is about how the bay was, years ago, a place of, of work, a place where there was commerce, there were fisheries, Anywhere you would look on the waterfront, you would see evidence of that type of work going on. But over the course of the last century, it's become a place of play. It's become a playground. And now you look around the waterfront, what do you see? You see the marinas, you see the restaurants, you see all the businesses catering to helping people have fun on the waterfront. Absolutely. Um, this is a great exhibit. It looks like we're in motion. <laughs> well, and we deliberately heeled the boats over it at angles like this, at angles at which they'd be sailing in a good breeze. And if you, th you think about sailing competition, one of the stories we tell here is how, if you think about America's Cup, the objective is to out-design and out-build the competition. And the man who has the best boat wins. Well, that's a rich man's game. The idea with these boats was that what if, what if we want to just find out who's the best sailor? Mm -hmm. Let's all go out and get the same boats. So we took that a step further and said, well, let's not look at such an expensive boat. What if, what if we all get a simpler, smaller boat, a boat that doesn't have a deep keel, but a centerboard so we can put it on a trailer, trailer behind our cars, put it in anywhere there's a ramp, and these boats, these comets, became all the rage in the 1930s and 1940s and beyond. A big class of them all around here. 
uh, on, on Miles River and, and elsewhere on the bay. Racing, yeah, racing was not, is, is not just for sail, uh, sailors, it's for power boaters too. And like with the, this hydroplane, now this is kind of high end stuff, this is high performance. Um, and this is kind of a wonderful story. It's the story of a rivalry between, uh, between Larry Lauterbach, who is the builder of this boat and also a racer, and Wheeler Baker. Uh, these two guys always raced each other. Uh, I, remember know, good, when, I, knew, I remember that when they were in Oxford and, and in Cambridge. And, and, and they still do race in Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge is a big place for these races. Uh, Kent Island is mm -hmm. a big place for these races. Uh, this was not a boat that Wheeler Baker himself raced, but he bought this boat for his daughter Gideon. And when his daughter Gideon got a little bit older, she married, she had a, started having a family, uh, and Wheeler thought that it wasn't such a good idea for his daughter to be racing these boats. They are a little dangerous, you know. And so at that point he give, gave the boat to the museum. So we've got this terrific race boat uh, that has this really interesting story that, uh, yeah, women did this too. Hmm, cool. Is this an old Chris Craft? This is very much like a Chris Craft, but Chris Craft uh, there was a, had a big rival here on the Chesapeake named Owens. Oh, they were right, built right. Up, in, up in Baltimore at Dundalk. And uh, in fact, in, in a certain size range, like these, these 30 footers, this is a 30 foot cruiser, slept six people, well, comfortably a family of four. Owens was actually outproducing Chris Craft uh, for a period of years back in the 1950s and, and I think into, into the 1960s as well. We can get on board? We can get on board. That's part of the fun. We can get aboard. We'll go below decks. You've got it like it's in the water. It's so cool. We've got it set like it's in a boathouse. Yes. And a boat like this would be best kept in a boathouse because with all this varnish, the sun absolutely kills it. And the ones that survived, like this boat, survived because they were well kept. Uh, and in fact, Owens didn't, didn't varnish all their boats up like this. This was kind of exceptional. And so it was, frankly, members of the Owens family who helped find this boat and say, this is the one that should represent the Owens story cool. in the museum exhibit. So we can, we can go be below. We can take a look in the galley. This is really nice. Now, this would cost how much money back in the 50s? This a family of four could could sail away back in the early fifties for ten thousand dollars. Ten thousand was a lot of money back then. Yes, but it was still a, you know a Volkswagen sold for like nineteen hundred bucks. <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. Here's the head. Oh, I remember boats of this era. My father had one. Yes. Not this big bike. <laughs> Lighthouses on the Chesapeake look different than lighthouses in other places. You think your classic lighthouse of your conical little stone tower. And that's of course not at all what lighthouses looked like in many places on the bay. We did have some of those around here, but, but not too much. This was much more typical, this screw pile lighthouse that sat out in the middle of the water because if you think about the bay's geography, very low-lying land, and a lot of shallow water stretching out from it. So to mark the channel, you couldn't be back there on the point of land. You had to build out in the middle of the water. The lighthouse wasn't useful unless it was out there next to the channel. And so that's how they built this lighthouse and many, many others like it. There's only a few of these survive that survive. We're lucky to have one of them that was saved, uh, I mean, in literally. The mid -60s. In the mid 60s. In the mid, we, we literally bought the lighthouse from the demolition contractor. Well, they, they, they actually screw this into the into the mud, and how do they do that? The name, yeah, the name "screw pile" comes from, instead of just pounding pilings into the mud, they they screwed them down. There's a, a screw thread at the bottom of the of the piling, so it took a lot more time to do this. But the good thing was, then when the ice froze around the piling, it couldn't heave the thing back out because eh, it doesn't freeze every winter. But we do get some uh, some ice from time to time here on the bay. This is another example of sort of how we've adapted, how the bay's geography, how the nature of this place has shaped us. It's shaped the way we built our lighthouses. It's shaped our fisheries. It's shaped us in so many ways. And, and 
this lighthouse is just yet another example of that. So what was the date that this was actually installed in the bay? This would be the mid-1800s? This one was built 1879. They started building these, oh, just before the Civil War. And they proliferated in the decades after the Civil War. So 1879, and then it served. There were people serving aboard this lighthouse until 1954. No kidding. Uh, at which point they just automated it. And there is still a light at the location where this lighthouse was, but there's no lighthouse. They still needed a light there, but they didn't need a house for the people to tend the light. And so it's, there's just a simple steel tower there today. We've, built, we've done the exhibit in this lighthouse so that it's completely self-guided. And the wonderful thing about this, instead of having a guide take you through the lighthouse, is that there's a process of discovery. So everywhere you look, there's some sort of label to tell you <laughs> what, is, what is going on. Show it, show it, it's funny. That tells you the story and then there's the biscuits. The biscuits. Here. So, um, the lighthouse service always had a hard time finding men who were suitable for duty. I'll bet. And, and we tell the story if you, that in 1904, the door to the stove broke. And in here is where we tell the story. And keeper George Hart immediately wrote to the inspector to send a new door for a, a farmer girl number eight stove. Uh, and so we tell the story. You have to open the door to take a look. So every, we invite people to open things up and look, turn things over and look around to learn the story in the lighthouse. And wherever possible, we tell that, those stories in the words of the keepers or from the instruction manuals to the keepers from sources for, of that time. That's great. So this is the bedroom in here, and then you've got the kitchen here, and then the office is in there. What does is, what is this thing do? These are the, the counterweights for the fog bell mechanism. It, they would wind it up, and for two hours it would ring the fog bell. Oh, that's funny. And uh, you had to make sure you were awake again in two hours to wind it up again, as if you were going to sleep when there was uh, that bell Sorry. going on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go up. up. This way? This way. Okay. Well, this is the whole purpose of the lighthouse, of course, the lens. This is, this is the light uh, that was meant to be seen from miles away, and what the lighthouse keeper was here to make sure got lit every evening and cleaned uh, the following morning. Uh, of course, there was no power. No, 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 no. This was, this, these were, would have been oil lamps of, okay. of one sort or another. So you have an oil lamp in the middle of that? That's exactly right. Uh, and of course, later, later they were electrified. There are still lights like this, lenses like this out there that are electrified today. Uh, mostly they've replaced them with these funny little plastic beacons. But uh, the whole idea with this is that you didn't need a lot of candle power to really put a, a bright beam out. Uh, now, and the wonderful thing about this spot, seeing the harbor from here, this is the best view of St. Michael's. Absolutely. Uh, you get a great panor panoramic view of the museum grounds, of the Miles River, uh, of all the boats coming in and out of the harbor. Uh, it just, uh, there's, there's nothing quite like it. Uh, so many people come through the museum gate and they make a beeline to the lighthouse because uh, this is the view to be had. One of the museum's best exhibits is the working boatyard. Uh, we maintain historic watercraft here, and in order to maintain these historic boats, we also maintain the skills. We preserve the skills needed to maintain these boats. So we have shipwrights and, in, in fact, shipwright apprentices uh, working here. And what we're about to see is, well, you know, in a way this is routine, but it's, it's one of the, the neat things that goes on in this yard. They're about to pull a plank out of the steam box and bend it into shape on the side of this 1912 river tug named Delaware. They, the plank is in there with the steam to, to warm it up uh, so that it's, it's um, wet and supple. Uh, a, a, a smaller plank will almost get like a spaghetti noodle. It'll get that supple. And it uh, now can be bent uh, much more easily into place uh, than, than, it could, than it could just dry. This is a traditional skill, uh, part of, of, of wooden shipbuilding as it's been practiced for, for generations.
And as the plank cools, it will take the form of that, that, it, that it should. It will, it will hold that curve that they're bending it into. This tug is, is uh, on the eve of her centennial. She's, she's now just about 100 years old, built in 1912 in Bethel, Delaware by a man by the name of William Smith and used to carry to tow sailing vessels up and down the rivers on the eastern shore. In a way, this was a power boat that helped extend the lives of sailing vessels because the sailing vessels could continue to carry their cargo most of the distance under sail, but when they arrived on these narrow winding rivers on the eastern shore or in port in Baltimore, they took a tow uh, to get them into places where it was really too difficult to maneuver under sail. Uh, and for, therefore, another generation, these sailing vessels continued to carry commerce around the bay. Coal, lumber, fertilizer, grain, all sorts of bulk goods like that would have been carried around the bay on sailing vessels uh, thanks to tugs like this little Delaware. So we, we took out an old pine plank, we're putting in a new pine plank, we're using exactly the techniques with which the boat was originally built, and we do this in front of the public. The, the exercise of preserving these boats is just part of the exhibit at the museum.